Hi, welcome to the workshop. Now you may remember a while back I dragged a boat into the workshop. It was an Electra 23, which is actually a lake launch and it had loads of things that needed doing on it. And of course I barely even started that. And now it's the summer, it seems a shame not to be out on the river every once in a while. So I need another boat and I found one, but that also needs a bit of work. And here it is, it's a 14 foot Windermere open launch. Now it's actually called a launch because it has a motor inside, even though it looks a bit like a dinghy. And it was built way back in 1958 by Borix of Windermere using traditional clinker construction with copper rivets, which is why it looks so gorgeous. Now, yeah, sure, there's a few bits and pieces that are gonna need to be repaired, but essentially it's ready to plop back into the water, ready for some summer fun. Now the name Hafren, it actually refers to an ancient English princess who was drowned by her Welsh mother-in-law. And that leads me to our first problem because I'd rather like to avoid that. Now the thing is I found this languishing my mate Martin's yard and it had been out of the water for a couple of years and that's a problem with wooden boats because as you can imagine it's a natural material and it has full of these tiny little cells. Now over time when it's left out of the water out into the dry then of course those cells give up their moisture and that wood then starts to shrink and of course that means you end up with gaps in between all of those rather vital wooden parts. So when you plop it back into the water if you don't do anything properly don't rehydrate the wood then of course those gaps are going to let water in and it's going to sink to the bottom just like Hafren. So one of the first things I'm going to need to do is actually hydrate the hull all over again before we put it back in the river and to do that properly I'm going to need to take up all the floor just to get to the bilge to get rid of any debris that might go into those gaps and actually stop them from sealing properly. But then hopefully once we've got to the point where we can actually bob about on the river it'd be nice to go somewhere and for that I need to turn my attention to this rather lovely original Stuart Turner engine which sits under here. Right, so if I just take off the lid, it reveals our little engine here, and then a little bit of deft movement around the throttle is on the back here. It should be able to reveal our little original Stuart Turner engine. Now this is a four horsepower P5M. The M stands for marine, so it's a kind of marinized engine for one thing, but also as you can see, it's got this thing called a Dyna start. So it's like a dynamo, but also works as a starter motor. So this is like a sort of an optional extra at the time. And if you look at the engine numbers of this particular engine, they were actually made from between 1958 and 1966. So chances are it is the original engine for the boat, which of course is 1958. So it's quite wonderful. The question is, will it actually work? Well, I guess to make it a bit easier, I'm going to take a bit more of the floor away now as well, so I can kind of see everything that's going on. Right, so we're down to the last piece of flooring and you can see we've already revealed a few nasties including two drain plug holes that haven't actually been done up so that would have definitely scuppered us when we try to get into the river. Now this last piece of flooring, as you can see here at the back, there's a coil that's been screwed into the wood. Now interestingly on this model of motor, Back in the early days, it would have had a magneto for ignition, and then a bit later on, it would have then moved over to having a coil and points. And what's interesting is that this doesn't actually look very stock. So obviously somebody's just gone for some reliability or maybe just to replace some parts they couldn't get hold of. Either way, I'm gonna need to remove that out of the way before I can then I'll take out my bit of flooring. <laughs> so we'll see a knack to this. There we go. Well, the Stuart Turner P5M was one of a series of very reliable motors made by Stuart Turner down in Henley-on-Thames, which is also famous, of course, for the rowing regatta and Thames Traditional Boat Festival. Now, this particular little beastie is a single-cylinder, two-stroke motor developing four horsepower. There was a P55, which was actually a twin-cylinder and obviously developed twice the horsepower. Now, it's got a number of unique features you might not normally see on a modern engine. You've got this sort of shaft here, which means you can actually crank the engine over with a crank at either end, wherever you're sitting in the boat. So you've got the water pump on the side of the engine here, and that draws the water down from the base of the hull from the river. Obviously, then it flows it back around the engine and then back out into the river once it's actually done some cooling. Now you can see nestling just down here, you've actually got the carburetor, and then if you follow that pipe all the way, that takes you obviously to the fuel tank, which is at the front or the bow of the boat. And then 
obviously on this side you've got the exhaust system which then goes out through the back of the boat or the stern. So at the moment you can see it's obviously quite simple, it's quite easy to get to all the different bits and pieces. The next thing I want to do is to see if I actually can crank it over, if I can get a spark and then eventually we can get some fuel and then we can get it to run. I think to do all that, I might do it in the workshop because the clouds are gathering. Now, part of the success of this motor is really down to its simplicity. Now, I mentioned it was a two-stroke motor, which means, of course, it hasn't got any valves or cams or anything like that. But, of course, the way that it can actually open and close the exhaust and inlet ports is really by the movement of the piston. So, if I get myself a stunt piston, and a very tasty one at that. So, if you imagine you've got your piston moving up and down inside the cylinder. Now... As I say, there are no valves, but there are ports. So if you imagine just on the engine here, you can see the carburetor sort of going into the side of the combustion chamber there inside of the cylinder right there. And that vacuum port be represented by a spanner. So normally on this particular orientation, it'd be here, but if we move it around so you can see what's going on. So if we start the process sort of in the middle of the stroke, so the piston is halfway between top dead center and bottom dead center, then as it's moving upwards, it's actually causing a vacuum in the crankcase. And then as it keeps going out, it gets more and more of a vacuum, and then suddenly it opens that port, and that allows the fresh air from outside to go through the carburetor, so fuel is added, and then that goes in that mixture, the fuel-air mixture goes into the crankcase. And then when the piston comes back down again, it's actually squishing that fuel-air mixture, compressing that, but then on this side, you can actually see there's this big sort of cylinder here, that's actually like an expansion chamber for the exhaust system. So if you imagine we have our exhaust port here, as the piston is coming down, compressing that gas in the crankcase, of course it's been driven by the explosion of the previous cycle, and then eventually of course that explosion and all those sort of burnt gases or the exhaust get to leave through the exhaust port, they go into this expansion chamber, that allows the engine to work a bit more efficiently, it gives it a bit more breathing space if you like, and reduces the back pressure, and then that then goes down through the exhaust system. Now, obviously, at the same time, just after that, there's a port on the other side, the transfer port, and that's then revealed. And, of course, that then allows that compressed fuel-air mixture in the crankcase to blow up into the top of the cylinder. And there's a special shape, like a little ski ramp, on the top of the piston, and that kind of helps swirl that fuel-air mixture into the top of the cylinder. And then as the piston starts going back up again, it compresses that gas. When it gets to top dead center, the spark plug, which is in the middle of the head there, actually then obviously fires, causing an explosion. That explosion and then drives the piston down, giving you your power stroke. And then the whole process starts again. So if that explains how the two-stroke engine actually works, there also could be a couple of little red herrings here. Now, these little copper pipes are actually to do with the cooling system. So as we looked at earlier, we've got this little cylinder coming out of the hull of the boat. There's actually a little valve on there, so you can actually turn off the water flow into the cooling system. But that pipe then goes onto the back here where there is the water pump. That water pump then pushes the water up here to the inlet into the engine. So that's actually cooling this expansion chamber first. And then that water goes around the rest of the block through the water jacket and eventually comes out the top just above the cylinder here and again spat into the exhaust system. Now part of the reason for that is really all about just keeping everything as cool as possible. Bear in mind of course there's a nice little box over the top here, there is no radiator, this is the cooling and of course you've got infinite amount of water coming from the river or the sea which is quite handy but obviously by spraying the water which is still going to be kind of warm, not necessarily hot into the exhaust, it's going to keep the exhaust which is the hottest part nice and cool and that makes everything manageable especially bear in mind again there's very little airflow inside this box but also you've got that exhaust point running through the inside of the boat could be a bit of a fire hazard so again cooling it down just helps with that it also helps actually muffle the sound that the exhaust is making so it just makes the whole thing a lot more pleasant to be in now another element of this design which is beautifully simple is this little handle here as i mentioned earlier on you've actually got this shaft going through the length of the engine so you can actually crank it over and it's got a little ratchet on there as well so you don't get kind of dragged around with the engine when it actually starts but you could do the same thing from the rear of the engine as well, which is quite cool, but you can use the same lever to go forwards and backwards. By moving this lever backwards and forwards, you can actually go ahead or you can go astern. So it is a lovely, simple mechanism, but of course you can't really go very far without it, so you best not lose it. Now, just a bit below on the same mechanism here, you can see there's this little lever here, that's for the throttle, so it controls how fast or slow the engine spins and therefore how fast or slow you go. Now, following this little shaft, towards the engine, there's a little cam on the end and that's actually just to help sort of open the throttle up a little bit just to help with starting, a little bit like a choke really. 
So it is a very, very simple engine, which is quite wonderful, but I've still got to get it to start. And you can see one of my big issues is going to be the electrical system because that's been messed with the most. There's some spare wires missing. Obviously, we know that the coil probably wasn't standard. And clearly, there's no battery. So I think before I get busy, I'm actually trying to get things to start. Maybe a little bit of a clean would be a good idea. Now, I'm donning the eye protection and changed my gloves because I'm going to be playing around with some spray cleaner. Well, while I'm here cleaning the engine, I might as well also clean the bilge. So all of the area underneath, all those bits of debris and dirt and stuff, just clean all of that up as well, so the whole place is spotless. Now I've removed the main detritus from the bottom of the hull or the bilge, but I will come back a bit later and do a really thorough clean before we try and do the taking up or the rehydration of the wood. The good thing is though, I can now see a bit better <laughs> what I've got before me. And the first obvious thing is that the wiring is in quite a state. And we will need to rely on that very shortly when I try and start the motor. But there are a number of things you have to do before you take a boat out of the water and leave it out for any length of time. One of the first things is make sure that all the coolant system is drained down, there's nothing left in the exhaust, because of course that could rot over time. But also, you need to make sure there's no fuel in the fuel tank, you need to drain that out as well. So I'll have a quick look in here. Well, that's looking pretty dry. And of course, it's particularly important nowadays with all the ethanol in our fuel. That plays havoc with seals and gaskets and other bits of metal and stuff. So it definitely makes sense to drain that out, especially if you're going to leave it for a very long time out of the water. Now, another really important thing was actually a strict requirement in the Stuart Turner handbook is to drain your gearbox oil. And the main reason for that is actually, for one thing, it may well have water in it, but also it'd be contaminated by the fuel in the engine. And so therefore, it may be too thin. So the thing is to drain it all out and then refill it with brand new oil before you leave it standing for any length of time. So the next thing I want to do is just to check the condition of that oil and see if that job's been done. Well, actually, it doesn't look that bad. I mean, it's a bit darker, perhaps, than I would imagine it was going to be. <laughs> but it smells really, really fuely. So I think probably this hasn't been changed. I guess you wouldn't really know if you hadn't actually read the instructions. So I think the thing to do is probably top this out for some new stuff. And I guess that means you've got to drain this one out. Well, to get the gearbox oil out of the gearbox, I need to undo this little drain plug down here. And there's a very convenient little tray. And somebody who's very handily actually cut a slot in that tray. So I need to find another way of extracting that oil out of the tray before it goes into the bottom of the boat. But to get this drain plug undone, I'm going to need to use a special set of tools because it's an old English machine. It's actually held together using BSF or British Standard Fine nuts and bolts. And they're slightly different. So none of my metric or imperial sockets and spanners are actually going to fit. So just like when you're working on a Japanese vehicle, you have to use Japanese industrial standard screwdrivers. For this, I'm going to need to use a BSF socket. Now, when you think about imperial tools, for example, most people think of them as inch sizes or AF. And AF actually stands for width across flats. So if you think about a nut or a bolt, well, so you have the head and of course AF would be width across there. So of course that spanner or socket is actually defined by the size of the head and it works the same way for metric. But for BSF and in fact also another standard called Whitworth, it's all about the size of the thread itself. So BSF and Whitworth are defined by the thread not the head. And just to confuse things just a little bit more, Whitworth is a slightly coarser thread than BSF, and also Whitworth bolts generally have a one size bigger head than the same equivalent for the BSF. But the same spanners and sockets will work, and that is what I'm going to use to undo this. Right now, because of this little slot in the sump there, 
where they all would normally collect rather than having oil go all over the bottom of the boat i've got this vacuum device here now it works it's powered by air basically so you have the compressed air rushing through here coming out through this little sort of silencer at the end there and that causes a low pressure inside the vessel causing a vacuum which means i can suck out the oil so i'm just going to pop down a little bit of paper towel just in case the oil does tend to escape and now we're pretty much ready to go so i'll turn that on We've got a vacuum going. Let's undo our sump plug. absolutely the right thing to do to drain and change the oil because it absolutely reeks of fuel and that means it's going to be much thinner and therefore won't be protecting all those mechanical parts. Now handily to refill the oil there's a little port on the top of the gearbox and that's also going to help fill the chain case inside there as well so basically everything will be nice and protected and the oil I'm going to be using is 30 grade it's just the kind of standard thing you'd have in an air-cooled Volkswagen or for almost many machines of this particular era and it takes about a pint so here goes. Right, so now let's check the dipstick. Oh, look at that, spot on, lovely. So we now have our fresh oil in the gearbox. And while I'm here, I'm also just gonna look at this little drain plug here. It goes obviously into the expansion chamber for the exhaust. Now obviously, because you've got oil in the fuel, there's a chance that we're gonna get some collecting in here. So I'm just gonna make sure, drain that out. Oh dear, look at the color of that. So it's not much. But I'll just get the old vacuum on it again. Right, so now we're happy with that. The next thing we want to think about is the ignition. Well, it makes a nice change to be working on an old clinker boat, and that Stuart Turner engine is a lovely bit of old English engineering. As you can see, I'm on my own in the workshop today. Apparently, Paul says he needs yet another rest, but it's always lovely to talk to you guys. And if you haven't clicked subscribe already, please do consider so because it does help us out. And also keep your questions and comments coming. Talking of questions, there was one last time from Crossfire Lance. Now he had a problem with his Mercedes Sprinter, a limp home mode issue that was related to his turbos. Now loads of you had lots of really useful advice. You can actually see all of those in the comments of the previous episode, but two that kind of popped out. Now I've got one here from Brian Poppy and at work recently he's come across a couple of Sprinters who've had a problem with snapped inlet manifold bolts and that's actually caused a boost leak so he said look out for that. Now the other comment here is from Andy R500. Now he's also been working on some sprinters and he's been focusing on the transducers, the vacuum controllers that actually operate those turbos and he had to change two recently that both operate on the smaller turbo so clearly that is a problem. And then he had a third sprinter which had an issue with a vein or a blade from the turbo actually sticking inside the turbo and of course again that's going to cause an issue with a delay to the response that the brain is actually expecting. So good luck with that Lance, lots to still look into. 
Right, well now it's time for Bid of the Week, again sponsored by H&H. And this auction is at the Imperial War Museum in Duxford on June the 22nd. Now, as always, there are a load of lovely vehicles to look at, but one that caught my eye was a 1911 Ford Model T Tornado body. Now, I have to say, the body looks nothing like a Tornado, but it is actually quite a luxurious version of the Model T. And after all, they made 16 and a half million over the time it was in production, which was unheard of at that time. And it could be yours for between 20 and 25,000 pounds, apparently. So that could be something to look out for. And there's another car that caught my eye. Now, you may remember that Paul and I, a while back, went on our little Ukrainian humanitarian aid mission. And it was with the Yorkshire Aid Convoy. Another Yorkshireman, Roy Hatfield, has also been inspired to help out with the Ukrainian crisis. He's actually going to donate all the proceeds of the auction of his 1976 Jaguar XJC 4.2. It's a wonderful looking car in black paint with a lovely red interior. Literally all the proceeds from the sale of Roy's Jaguar are going to go towards the Ukrainian humanitarian appeal. So please bid very strongly with that one. So it looks like it's going to be a really exciting auction. And it's at the Imperial War Museum at Duxford on the 22nd of June. And if you've got a car you'd like to sell, consignment closes on the 1st of June. So hurry up. Right, we've just got time for top tip of the week. And this week it's actually from Jim Tomchik from New Jersey. Thank you, Jim. Well, basically he was saying while fixing a rumbling sound in the rear of his front wheel drive Jeep Patriot, his problem was rusty drums rubbing on the edge of his brake shoes, making that horrible noise. So his top tip to fix it was actually to take the drums off, put them back onto the axle, back to front if you like, so they're sort of sticking out. He spun them round and then cleaned off that rust with a file without actually damaging the braking surface. And then once it was nice and clean, that rumbling went away. So that's a brilliant top tip, but actually reminded him of a top tip that his father had given him about half a century before. And that was if you ever have your problem trying to get the drums off in the first place, if they're frozen on to those hubs, what you do is you put the nuts back onto the studs, make sure they're nice and protected, then get yourself a two pound brass hammer and then kind of hit in between those studs all the way around again and again and again until the ringing noise kind of stops and turns into a dull thud. And by that time you then know that that frozen bit has actually kind of broken free and then you should be able to remove the drum. So there we go, two top tips in one. Right, well I better crack on with that Stuart Turner engine because I want it working by the end of the day because I want plenty of time to spruce up our amazing Outspan Orange ready for next week's Platinum Jubilee celebrations because we're going to be part of those festivities driving this orange down the mall, which will be very exciting. So there won't be an episode next week, but there will be one the week after that. So the next thing is a spark plug. Let's just pop off the lead. I'll do this to see what's been going on. You can see where it's too oily, too sooty, just right. It'll be lovely. Oh, there we are. Oh, well, it is quite oily. But actually, that's only the threads, which is good. The rest of it is looking quite dry. It's quite a nice little colour. We're sort of looking for this kind of slightly wheaty sort of colour. There's no soot or anything. So it looks like it's, although it's not looking pretty new on the outside, it's certainly looking new where it counts where the electrodes are. So that's cool. So hopefully that can pop out in there. So we're good to go with that. So the next thing is going to be having a look at the points. So now we know we've got a good spark plug. If we follow that HT lead all the way down, I mean, it's new-ish. It's quite dirty. You could do with a bit of a clean, but also a little kink just here. So I may need to actually change it because it may be broken inside the lead, but it's also perhaps the lead's a little bit too long as well. But really the most worrying thing is on the end of that is a standard coil you'd find in an old car. And the thing is, out of the factory, these would have been fitted with a magneto. And on closer inspection, I can just about see the LUC of Lucas, and it will be an SR magneto. They did all kinds of different versions, but this would be one of the early ones. And uh, theoretically inside this little device here, there'll be a coil and there's actually a shaft with this sort of spinning magnets. And the idea is that then every single rotation of the engine, you've basically got this thing spinning around and there's a load of gears in there and a spring and it kind of winds up in that rotation. And then right at the end, it suddenly just lets go. And so it spins much faster than it would if it was going the same speed as the engine. And that generates a lot of energy in the coils of wire that are around the actual coil pack 
that's inside there and of course that eventually then is stored in a capacitor and then the points when they open at the right time then send all that energy to the spark plug and as it earths of course it makes a big spark and of course that's what ignites our fuel air mixture so it's a very reliable very very clever device but clearly because there's a coil here there's obviously been a bit of a problem so I think the first thing I do is just double check just take this little cover off here which actually holds the magneto down to this plinth so I can see what model it is perhaps then we'll have a look on the other end here to see what's going on inside. Yeah, there you go, so it definitely says Lucas, a bit further down. We've got the SR and it also says Magneto, so we're on the right lines at least, and it's probably the Magneto that would have come with the engine out of the factory. So that's good news, but now we have to work out what's going on with this coil. Why is there an extra on the outside rather than one on the inside? Before I go there, I'm going to take the front cover off, but I'm just going to bolt this back down again because this little strap I removed actually holds everything in place on this plinth and also allows adjustment to make sure that the coupling to the water pump is actually in good order. So I'm going to put it back where it was. Right, so just undo the screws holding on the cover. Okay, the screw is holding on the cover, that's handy. Obviously had a bit of abuse in its life, but it makes my life a little bit easier right now. So just take that off. So what have we got inside? So straight away you can actually see this aluminium can. Now if this was working as a magneto, that would probably be a capacitor. I'm guessing because it's got a coil, there's actually now a condenser. You can also see the pretty standard looking points. And significantly, there's a void here, and that's where the coil should be for the magneto. And just beneath that, you can sort of see a shaft of these kind of lumps on, because well, actually magnets, and the idea is that as they spin past the coil, they generate electromotive force, electricity. And then essentially, that's what we then what fills up the capacitor, and then of course, it makes a nice big spark at the points when they actually can close and connect down to the earth through the spark plug. So, that's obviously why this coil is in position is because that coil is missing for whatever reason. Now, if I now just take off this crank handle and spin it over, we might, there we go, you can hear that click. That's actually the magneto winding up and then releasing. There we go. So also, as I'm spinning this round, you should see the points here, hopefully, are actually opening and closing as well, as they sort of are. Not a very big gap, but it might be enough. They can certainly do with a bit of a clean. Right, so I'm just going to just use a screwdriver just to go against sort of the cam and the follower to open the points up. I'm just going to put a little bit of, in this case, sandpaper, but you could use emery cloth or anything vaguely abrasive. And I'm just going to just move it backwards and forwards, just trying to clean the points so you've got a nice metal on metal surface, so that way you've got the best chance of getting a good spark. Actually, they're not looking as bad as I suspected. So now the point's are clean, I'm just gonna give it a good clean with an airline, just to make sure that there are no nasties and then little bits of metal, which of course could get in the way of the spark. So according to the manual, I've just basically got to find a gap of between 0.012 and 0.015 of an inch, which is basically roughly just over 0.3 or 0.38 of a millimeter. So I've gone for 0.35, sort of bang in the middle-ish, so. Now the thing is, if it's too small, you're going to struggle with idle. If it's too big a gap, then it'll actually miss fire when it's running at full chat. So it, it makes sense to get it right. That's actually pretty good. I'm looking for a nice light drag on the feeler gauge. And actually, I think we're good to not have to adjust that. So again, it does suggest that despite the fact that the magneto isn't quite stock, this boat has been looked after in the past, which is a good thing. So now we've definitely got our gap is okay. We know our spark plug is okay. The next thing we need to do is actually wire up the coil and then see if we actually get a spark when we spin over the engine. Now obviously to get our spark, we're gonna need some voltage and that's gonna come from our battery, which normally sits on the floorboards here, just under the seat. But we're also gonna to need to have a way of actually turning on that battery or at least making the connection to the coil. And unfortunately, Martin, the previous owner has actually managed to lose the keys. So I have to get around that just to see if we can get this engine to start. And because all of that gubbins is in here, I'm actually gonna lift up this seat to give me a bit more access. Oh, 
Right, so there you go. So that is our seat. You can see you've got the various bits of governance here. You've got a regulator, obviously, for our dynamo there. You've got a coil, which is obviously what's going to actually energize the dynamo in the first place. And you've got your ignition key and then a kill switch for the battery. So I'll just get the floor in and then we can kind of start up from there. Right, so I've extricated my box of electrics from our seats there, and you can see the wiring really is in quite a mess, but there is a chance that it might work, and I am itching to find out whether this motor is gonna run. So we're gonna go with what we have right now. I've managed to find myself a little key for the kill switch, and I've also managed to find myself a key for the ignition. So that's all gonna be groovy, so that's just gonna pop in there like so. So the next thing, I guess, is just to see what happens. Let me plug it in, it looks like the wires are all kind of going in the right sort of place. So let's hope nothing horrible happens. So here we go. I'm going to put on the ignition, first of all. Oh, and we have a little red light, which is quite good news. So that means it's kind of like back feeding in through this regulator, ultimately. So when the generator is spinning up, it's generating some voltage. That light should go out. So before we check for the spark, I'm just going to see if it actually turns over. <laughs> oh, that sounds great already. So that's wonderful. So our little Dynastar is doing the trick. It is spinning it over rather nicely. So the next thing to check is a spark. So let's just pop off that like so, and then take the plug out. Now I haven't put any fuel in yet, because quite a good top tip is to not try your spark just above the cylinder head there, because of course there's gonna be so much fuel and air inside there that it get a nice big blast of flame. All right, so just pop the spark plug back into there. I'm going to use the battery as my earth. So then, here we go. Oh, look at that. We have spark as well, which is rather great. So I can pop that back in there. So now all we need is a bit of fuel. And being two stroke, I've actually got to add some oil into the fuel. I'm going to be using some more of the 30 grade. It's going to end up in the engine anyway. And then, and it's about a ratio of 25 to 1. So just do that up. Pop that on there. Mix some fuel. Right, well we now have our fuel in our tank and it is gravity fed, so if I open this tap, hopefully it will start to wend its way down here. It's not, oh it's coming up. Well the first great sign is this little needle here has kind of risen up and that's because it's connected directly to the float which is sitting on the fuel, so if it's risen up then it must be on top of some fuel which is good. So now I need to kind of prime the carburetor just by tickling it, so I'm just going to wobble this up and down. And you can see there, a little bit of fuel now is just coming out of this little tiny hole here. So we've flooded the carburetor there. Now the last thing I need to do is just adjust the idle speed cam, this little lever here, all the way over to there. And basically that's just like putting your foot on the gas a little bit, just to give a little extra bit of fuel into the engine. So here goes. So uh, we've got ignition, our little red light is on. Spin it over. <laughs> Might give it just a little bit more gas. There we go, there we go. Right. Oh, ho, ho, ho! that's brilliant. Oh, hang on. <laughs> well, I reckon that works nicely. <laughs> Quite smoky but it is a two-stroke. But listen to that, that is really rather lovely. 
So, now the engine works, all I've got to do is sink the boat. But that is a job for another day. <laughs>